Well, good evening, everybody. You guys hear me all right? Um, it's good to see everybody tonight. There are some handouts. They might all they might all be gone. I don't know, but it's got the powerpoints. They're all gone. Okay, if you if you need a handout, just put your hand up, and we can get you one. It's just um, the the slides that I'm using. By the way, all the slides for this course, uh, the doctrine of soteriology, you can find on our website, as long uh, along with uh, video archives and audio archives of all these teachings. So it's there for you long after the class is over. But this class is basically uh, what's called soteriology, which basically means the doctrine of salvation. You know, what, is the, what does the whole Bible reveal about the subject of salvation? And we are in Lesson 6. And if you haven't been here for the prior lessons, that's okay. You should be able to still pick up uh, where we left off, because each of these lessons is sort of uh, self-containing. And I want to thank Earl last week for filling in. Thank you, Earl. Where, oh, there he is, right there in the front. And if you're a man, so that would exclude women, uh, unless you really want to come, then we'll let you. We're having a men's breakfast this Saturday morning at 8 a.m., and our speaker is going to be Doyle Davis, who is a, um, a pastor in Houston. And he usually brings messages that are very politically incorrect and deal with volatile political issues. So if you're into that kind of thing, uh, we'd invite you to come and listen to uh, Pastor Davis 8 a.m. Uh, <coughs> Saturday morning. So we're looking forward to that. So here we are in our course on the doctrine of salvation. And we're in this section called God's One Condition of Salvation. And what we tried to communicate in that session, prior session, because I wasn't here last week, Earl taught, but the last time I taught, uh, we were in this section called God's One Condition of Salvation. And we basically worked through this whole idea that the Bible is very clear that salvation is conditioned upon one human response. Now, what's that one human response? Faith. And we saw that the Bible teaches this close to 200 times. So that was the big idea from that session. And now what we're moving into, and we're not going to be able to get through all of these tonight, but we're moving into passages that at first glance seem to contradict the 200 passages that teach salvation is by faith alone. So... At first glance, there are a handful of passages that make it look as if, at first glance, that you don't just believe in Christ to be saved. You believe in Christ plus do something else. So there are actually passages in the Bible that read this way. And so what I'm trying to teach you how to do is to harmonize the handful of passages with the 200 clear ones. And what you'll discover today in modern day evangelicalism is people, for whatever reason, they don't build their salvation message off the 200 clear ones. They always gravitate toward the remote ones. And I think that's sort of a backwards way of thinking. I think we need to understand the remote ones in light of the 200 clear ones. So that's what I mean by problem passages if that makes any sense. So here's sort of a large outline that we're going to follow, and we're, we're not, we may not even get through the first one today. 
because there's a lot of confusion in the body of Christ today about this. But if salvation is by faith alone, what do you do with the word repent? What do you do with people that say you have to submit to Christ's lordship to be saved? What do you do with phrases like receive Christ and accept Christ? What do you do with passages that say faith without works is dead? What do you do with passages that make it look like you've got to be baptized to get to heaven? What do you do? This is a controversial one. We won't be getting to this tonight. But what do you do with those passages that say you've got to confess Christ? Because most um, evangelistic tracts that you see out there, they say you're saved by faith, by grace, not by works. And then they give you three works to do. So they contradict themselves. And so a lot of people make it sound as if you have to make some kind of public confession of Christ. You know, you have to walk an aisle. Other people say you've got to ask Jesus into your life. Uh, Other people say you've got to confess your sins to be a Christian. You've got to forgive others to be a Christian. A lot of people say you've got to sell all your possessions to be a Christian. And some people say you've got to pray a prayer of saving faith. In other words, if you haven't prayed a prayer of saving faith, then a lot of people will question whether you're a Christian at all. And at first glance, there are passages that people use that look like they support these ideas. But what I'm going to try to show you in these sessions is these passages can all be harmonized if understood properly with the 200 clear ones. That say, that say you're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. So that's sort of the direction uh, that we're moving in. Um, is the mic picking up okay? You guys good with that? All right. So let's start with the first one, and this is a very, very controversial one. That's why I'm going to go through each of these slowly. It may take me, I, I usually teach till 8, eight o'clock, which is about an hour. Then we open it up for questions, but it may take me the whole hour just to cover the first one. Uh, What do you do with the word repent? And then, as time permits, I'm not sure we'll get to it, what do you do with lordship? Because you have passages where Jesus told Peter, if any man wants to follow me, he must pick up his cross, deny himself. So he was calling Peter to submission. What do you do with passages like that? And can passages like these be harmonized with the 200 clear ones that say we're saved by faith alone in Christ alone? So let's start with the word uh, repent. You might take a look here at Acts 2, uh, verse 38. Now we went through all of these passages last time we were together or the last time I was with you, showing that salvation is by faith alone. And then all of a sudden you get to Acts 2.38, and Peter doesn't even mention faith on the day of Pentecost when he's calling for the unsaved to be saved. Acts 2.38 says, Peter said to them, repent. So you don't see the word faith there at all, you see the word repent. Repent. And there are a series of verses that say this. Um, I have them there on the screen at the top. Acts 3.19, you'll see the word repent in the context of what the unbeliever is supposed to do. Paul on Mars Hill in Acts 17 verse 30 says repent. Uh, Peter says it's God's desire for all men to come to repentance and be saved. So, you know, you you read these verses, you say, well, which is it? Do we repent or do we believe? And if they're two different things, which one comes first? Do I believe first, then repent? Or do I repent first, then believe? And so you can see how just the words that the Scripture uses bring forth a lot of confusion, unless you understand these words uh, properly. So let's focus just for a minute on the word repent And you'll notice there at the top, uh, I've got a list of things of what repent means. 
And then towards the bottom, you'll notice I've got a couple of things repent does not mean. And half the battle is trying to figure out what this word repent means. So taking, for example, the word repentance, what exactly does it mean? The Greek word repent, now these words both come from the same root. You can use the word as a noun or you can use the word as a verb. Okay, Just like the word run. I could use it as a noun, I went on a run, or I could use it as a verb, I need to make a run to the store. So that's how language functions. You have words being used in the noun form and the verbal form. Well, what's the original meaning of this word repent? The Greek verb translated repent is metanoeo. The Greek a, a word repentance in the noun form, translated repentance, is uh, metanoea. So metanoeo, verb, metanoea, noun. What does that word actually mean? Well, it's what you would call a compound word. A compound word is basically two words that are combined into a single word. So the word Repentance is made up of two different uh, words combined into one. The first one is meta, and the second one is noeo. And if you understand what those words mean, you won't be confused about repentance. Because a lot of times, as Christians, we're throwing out the word repentance to unbelievers, and they don't even know what you're talking about. To them, repentance means something totally different than the way we use it many times. And because we don't take the time to explain it, we end up preaching a gospel to them that's very confusing and can actually be a works-oriented gospel which God will not accept. So meta is the first of those words. You know, you, know, you recognize the word meta. Meta means to change. From the word meta, you get all kinds of different words that you're familiar with, like metabolism, where the food has entered your mouth and stomach, and it's changing, it's digesting. I think some of that's going on right now, actually, after that fine meal we had, particularly that cheesecake. Very good, by the way. So metabolism, change. Uh, you recognize the word metamorphosis, as in change, something uh, morphs or morphous morph means form changes from one form to another like uh, water can be changed to ice through freezing or steam through through boiling it and then uh, this is always a scary word to get from your doctor metastasize that, that's never good when your doctor says that that means your cancer has metastasized it's changed from one part of your body to another so meta just means change. Now the other compound word is noeo, from which we get the word notion. Things, uh, notions are ideas, and where do ideas come from? They come from the mind. So noeo means change. I'm sorry, meta means change, noeo means mind. So put, putting those two words together, into a single word, metanoeo, repentance, the only thing it really means is change of mind. So when the Bible is using the word repentance, particularly when it's being used with reference to what unbelievers are supposed to do to be right with God, the Bible is basically telling unbelievers to, ch to change their minds. That's literally what the word repentance means when you understand its uh, etymology. And uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, let me quote a few Greek lexicons. By the way, you'll notice Jim McGowan's picture up there. And that's because he put together a very good um, PowerPoint presentation back in 2003 on the whole concept of repentance. So I just went into his PowerPoint and stole most of his slides there because he did such a good job. Why reinvent the wheel? And if you ask Jim very nicely, he might send you that PowerPoint presentation. 
I don't know if I'm out of line by saying that. But. Um, so this is what Dr. McGowan writes. He says, the key question, he's talking about repentance, must be addressed. Is the word repentance to re- repent correctly defined as a turning from sin? And see, when you toss out the word repentance to an unbeliever, they don't understand anything about Greek. And when they hear the word repentance, what they think it means is to become a Christian, I've got to give up a bunch of things. So they think it means don't smoke, don't chew, and don't go with girls who do kind of thing. In other words, three steps to Jesus. And if, if that's true, that contradicts the 200 passages which reveal that salvation is by faith alone. So he writes, a brief look at two of the most authoritative Greek resources indicate that indeed this is not the case. In other words, repentance does not mean turn from sin. And here he's quoting uh, uh, Bagdi. Those those letters, Bagdi, that means uh, Bauer, they're, they're authors, Greek scholars. Bauer, Arndt, Gingrich, no, no correlation to the politician Gingrich, another guy. Gingrich and Danker, that's what those mean. So Bagdi is just a very well-accepted Greek lexicon. So he's quoting from this lexicon. He says, a Greek lexicon of the New Testament, other early Christian literature, indicates that the Greek word metanoeo, that's our word, is used to translate the English verb repent, and it means to change the mind. And he gives the page number. Moreover, this is a compound verb made up of the preposition meta, after, and the verb noeo, meaning to grasp or comprehend on the basis of a careful thought to perceive or to think, close quote. Thus, repentance means to perceive afterwards or to change the mind. So I'm not making things up. Uh, This is what the key lexicon of the day says about the word repentance. Here's another key uh, uh, lexical work. It's called uh, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. He's quoting from this. In pre-biblical and extra-biblical usage, metanoeo and uh, metanoeo are firmly related to are not, excuse me, firmly related to any specific concepts. At the first stage, they bear the intellectual sense of subsequent knowledge. With further development, both verb and noun then come to mean change of mind, which is exactly what I've been trying to argue. The change of opinion or decision, the alteration in a mood or feeling which finds expression in the terms is not in any sense ethical. It may be bad as well as for the good. You could change your mind about something bad, change your mind about something good. Um, For the Greeks, metanoeo never, continuing with uh, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, for the Greeks, metanoeo never suggests an alteration in the moral attitude, a profound change in life's direction, a conversion which affects the whole content. That the Greek word metanoeo means to change the mind is the consistent judgment of all lexicographers. So so when you throw the word repentance out, you have to understand the word biblically. The word simply means to change one's mind. What do you change your mind about as an unbeliever? You change your mind about whatever was inhibiting you from trusting in Christ alone. So for example... Uh, I heard the gospel clearly when I was 16 years of age. Prior to that point in time, if you asked me why I should go to heaven, I always gave this pat answer, well, I'm a good person. Look at all the things I've done. Look at how I went to Sunday school. 
and I had a perfect attendance. Look at how I was an acolyte, which is another way of saying an altar boy, in the Episcopalian church. And I've tried hard to live a good life. That was my answer. And then I, by God's providence, came to a Bible study when I was 16 years of age. I heard the gospel at that Bible study, and I heard that salvation is a free gift based on what Jesus has done for me. And at that point, I trusted in Christ. And at that point, I changed my mind simultaneously. I repented. I was no longer trusting in myself, my good works, my religiosity. My mind was changed. My confidence was shifted away from myself. And it was shifted um, exclusively to Jesus Christ. So the unbeliever needs to change their mind about whatever it is that's inhibiting them from trusting in Christ. So for the atheist, they need to change their mind about the fact that there is no God to shift their confidence in Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation. To the, going back here to Acts 2.38, uh, Peter tells this audience of Jews gathered on the day of Pentecost to repent. What is he asking them to do? He's asking them to change their mind. And what he's saying is change your mind about who Jesus is. Stop being a Christ-rejecting Jew, siding with what the nation of Israel just did in rejecting Christ, and change your mind away from the message of unbelieving Israel to my message, Peter says, where Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. So that's what you change your mind about. And when understood in this way, repentance becomes not an antonym for faith, but a synonym for faith. So now we've got to go back into... Uh, uh, eighth grade English, we've got to remember what a synonym is and what an antonym is. Well, an antonym is a different word, opposite meaning. And that's how your typical unbeliever looks at the word repentance when they have no training in the subject. They think it's, uh, I've got to believe in Jesus, but do something. Don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with girls who do, give up my tattoo, I can't pierce my ears anymore or pierce my nose or, or belly button. Or, and, that's, and, and you throw that word repentance at an unbeliever, that's what they think the gospel is. And that's not the gospel. The gospel is trust in Christ uh, alone. So repentance, if you understand it as a change of mind, is not an antonym for faith. It's a synonym for faith. What is a synonym? It's a different word, same meaning. So when you believe, you automatically repent. And when you repent, you automatically believe. Because your mind is changed, has been changed regarding what you are trusting in. You see that? So that is what uh, repentance means. And I like to put up these quotes because... A lot of people, when I talk this way, they think I'm talking some foreign language and I'm just making things up. But I'm, I'm put up these quotes to show you that this is a very traditional teaching that I'm giving here. Uh, Lewis Berry Chafer, the founder of Dallas Seminary, says this. A serious Arminian error. Now, don't worry about the word Arminian right now. We'll be going over that later on in the course. A serious Arminian error respecting that this doctrine occurs when repentance is added to faith or believing as a condition of salvation. Schaefer says it is true that repentance can very well be required as a condition of salvation, but then only because the change of mind which has been involved when turning from every other confidence to the one needful trust in Christ such turning about, of course, cannot be achieved without a change of mind. This vital newness of mind is part of believing. See that? It's a synonym for believing. After all, and therefore, it may be used as a synonym for believing. See, I've got synonym underlined. 
at times, and he goes through many different scriptures that use the word repentance with respect to unbelievers. And what he's saying is it's a synonym for believing. Then he says, repentance nevertheless cannot be added to believing as a condition of salvation. Because upwards of 150 passages of Scripture condition salvation upon believing only. The moment you start to understand the word repentance as something different than faith, added to faith, that's the moment you've taught the wrong gospel. And that's the moment you have contradicted close to 200 passages that teach the opposite. See. Now, look at what he says here. Similarly, the Gospel of John, which was written that men might believe and by believing have life through Christ's name. Let me stop right there. Look just for a minute at John 20, Gospel of John now, 20, verses 30 and 31. John comes out and he gives you his purpose statement in writing his gospel. And in the process, he says something that no book in the New Testament says. And notice what John says, John 20, the last two verses of the chapter. It says, Therefore many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John's gospel is the only New Testament book that we have which was written to the unsaved. Romans wasn't. Romans was written to the church at Rome. Philippians wasn't. Philippians was written to the church at Philippi. And you can go right on through the other 26 New Testament books and you'll see they're all written to believers to help them grow. John is different. John is written to the unsaved. How do I know that? Because he wants people to understand who Christ is. That means they must not know who Christ is. So John demonstrates who Christ is by a record of Christ's signs. John's gospel highlights about seven signs. The first is changing the water to wine in John 2. The last sign would be the uh, resuscitation of Lazarus from the dead. But you put all those signs together, there's about seven of them. And John carefully records these signs so that the unbeliever might know who Jesus is. And after reading this record of the seven signs, they would say, wow, Jesus is the Christ. Now, Christ is not Jesus' last name. We don't refer to him as Mr. Christ. Christ means the Messiah. So John catalogs these seven signs so that the reader, who doesn't know anything about Jesus, would conclude Jesus is the Messiah, that he's also the Son of God. And then John says, don't fold up your Bible and go home. This is not a theology lesson, just for the sake of theology. Now you as a believer need to go one uh, unbeliever rather need to go one step further and believe in Christ trust in him and when you do you'll consequently experience the gift of life that means this book was written to people that hadn't believed in Christ yet or this statement here makes no sense and they had not uh, received the gift of life yet so John's gospel, you have to understand that every book of the Bible is given for a particular purpose. John is given to evangelize the lost. And the reason that's so significant is in your life as a Christian, you're going to find people who are going to say to you, I'm, you know, I'm really thinking, you know, I'm not a Christian, but I, I'm interested. What book of the Bible should I start with? Where do you send them? Leviticus? You'll, you'll kill them in Leviticus. I'm not arguing that people can't get saved through Leviticus. God uses all sorts of ways to get people saved. 
what I'm trying to say is this book is unique or special. It's designed by God for a purpose to reach the lost. If someone asks you that question, you send them to John. That's why John was set up. So John's gospel is evangelistic. It's different than the other books of the, of the New Testament canon. So back to this quote. Similarly, the gospel of John, which was written that men might believe and by believing have life through Christ's name. What's he quoting there? The purpose statement that we just read. This gospel, watch this, does not once use the word repentance. And I have people telling me all the time, you better use the word repentance when you share the gospel. Well, let me ask you a question. If the word repentance is so critical, as everybody makes it out to be, why is it that the only evangelistic book of the Bible that we have uses the word believe 99 times, but it never once uses the word repentance? And I would say this, when you're interacting with an unbeliever, I would focus on the word believe properly defined as trust. I personally, when I'm with unbelievers, I don't even bring up the word repentance. And the reason I don't bring it up is because I know if I use the word, they're going to interpret it differently. And unless I have time to explain to them what repentance is, I don't even use the word. So my advice to you in your evangelism is to not even use the word repentance unless you have time to explain its meaning, metanoeo, as a synonym for faith. If you don't have time, because a lot of times evangelism is fast and it depends on the circumstances, there is absolutely no shame in dropping the word out entirely. If you want to bring it up, that's fine too. But make sure you explain to people what, what it is exactly you're talking about. So Chafer says, similarly, the Gospel of John, which was written that men might believe and by believing have life through Christ's name, does not once use the word repentance. In like manner, the epistle to the Romans, to formulate the complete statement of salvation by grace alone, does not use the word repentance. Now, the word does show up in different places, but not in relation to salvation. So, what are we trying to say exactly? Uh, Jim McGowan writes this. In contrast to the teachings of lordship theology. Now, I'll be explaining, not tonight, but probably next week, what lordship theology is. Lordship theology is the idea that you don't just believe in Christ to get saved. You have to submit to his lordship to be saved. So you don't just do one thing to be saved, you do two things. And I'll try to explain to you next time why we don't feel that that is a proper under, understanding. So there's a lot of confusion about this. But he writes, in contrast to the teachings of lordship theology, that repentance and belief are separate acts... It must be recognized that when the words believe and repent are found together, they are never used in a manner that would suggest two separate requirements for salvation. On the contrary, when salvation from eternal condemnation is in view, repent, parenthesis, a change of mind, and believe are in essence synonyms. That captures the point that we're trying to make here regarding repentance. Chafer again says, it is dogmatically stated as language can declare that repentance is essential to salvation and that no one could be saved apart from repentance, but it is included in believing and cannot be separated from it. Why is that? Because when you're believing, in the biblical sense, you're repenting because your mind is changing about who Jesus is. Uh, back to Chafer just for a minute. You're, you're shifting in your mind towards the end of that quote, away from every other confidence that you may have had, self, denomination, whatever, and you're shifting that confidence away from those things 
exclusively into Christ, you are believing or trusting in Christ, and consequently you are simultaneously, not separately, simultaneously repenting or changing your mind. Um, so hopefully I'm being somewhat clear. Uh, this PowerPoint goes on and it says a few examples where repentance is equivalent to belief in the person and work of Christ. Uh, here he uses Luke 5.32. Jesus declares, I have come to call, I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Here, repentance is evidently a synonym for faith or salvation through faith. The whole tenor of Jesus' ministry was to call men to faith in the gospel. Thus he says, repent, Mark 1.15, and believe the gospel. Not looking at those as separate things, but simultaneous things. 200 times the Bible says believe. I think about 30 to 35 times the, the Bible says repent. But those are not separate actions. Those are synonyms when you understand that repentance means change of mind or cha change of confidence. Um, Acts 11:18. The apostle declared, God has also granted to Gentiles... Repentance to life. It is clear from the context that repentance to life refers to Gentiles' faith in Christ. Because when you study some of those verses he's got there in parenthesis, Acts 10.43, Acts 11.17, what you'll see is in the surrounding context, it's belief that leads to life. It's belief that leads to forgiveness of sins. And then this verse comes in and says it's repentance that leads to life. It's repentance that leads to sin. Uh, excuse me, uh, not sin, but forgiveness of sins. And there is no contradiction there whatsoever if you understand that sometimes the Bible uses repentance synonymously for faith. No, no contradiction there at all. Now, if you don't understand that, it looks like you've got to do two different things. It looks like they're antonyms, but they are not antonyms. These are synonyms. Consider also Acts 10.43 with Acts 11.17 and 18. Acts 13, verses 38 and 39 with Acts 2.38. I mean, you'll, you'll see this over and over again in the Bible. Some verses say, believe and be forgiven other verses say, repent and be forgiven. Believe and receive the Holy Spirit. Repent and receive the Holy Spirit. No contradiction whatsoever if you understand that the two words are used synonymously. Different word, same meaning. Take a look at uh, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. It says there, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Now, if you don't have any background in the word repentance, you're going to think, well, what does that mean? Sorrow? Emotion? No. When he says the Lord wants all to be saved and come to repentance, he's all, the only thing he's saying here is God wants the world to change its mind about Jesus and to trust in Jesus, which is a synonym for faith. These, these verses actually get pretty easy to understand if you have just this little tiny background under your belt. If you don't have the background under your belt, you're left somewhat bewildered and confused. So that is what repentance means. Metanoeo, meta. -noeo, meta uh, no, noea, meta means change, noeo means mind, repentance means change of mind. You change your mind about whatever it is preventing you from trusting in Christ. And if understood that way, repentance becomes a synonym for faith. Now, what do, we went over what repentance means. 
Someone wrote an article. I like this article. It says we need to repent of how we use repentance. And I, I like that title. What does repentance not mean? We talked about what it means. What does it not mean? Repentance does not mean feel sorry or feel guilty. You see, on TV, the Billy Graham Crusades, you've got all these people coming forward to become Christians, and the, the, the TV cameras focus on all the tears people are shedding. You know, people, some people are crying a river. They're emoting. And people see enough of that, and they say, wow, to become a Christian, there must be some kind of emotional response on my part that I have to give to God. Well, let me ask you this. If God, if you give to God an emotional response to be saved, then your salvation is based on not just faith, but a work you created. God, as we saw in our prior session together, will not accept good works. That's why the gospel has to be kept crystal clear. The moment you insert a single work in it, is the moment it's no longer the gospel. That's why I'm going through this very slowly and very methodically. I mean, this is a big deal because the souls of people, to a very large extent, hang on how we share the gospel with them. Are we giving them God's message or a garbled and confused message? Now, when you, when you get saved, is it wrong to cry? No. Cry all you want. Emote and weep. And a lot of times people come to Christ weeping. That's not wrong at all. But that weeping is not a requirement. See? There's only one requirement, which is faith by itself. Now, how do I know this? Because in the Greek language, for emotion, such as sorrow or weeping or feelings of guilt, there is a totally different word that's used. It's not metanoeo, it's a totally different word called metamelomai. Metamelomai refers to emotion. Do you recognize the word mellow? Hey buddy, you better mellow out. In other words, you need to relax your emotions. See, we get emotional, emotionally oriented words from metamelomai. And the Bible never says metanoeo and metamelomai. It simply says meta noeo. So if emotion were required for a lost person to be saved, a totally different word would have been supplied other than meta noeo. Now let me give you some verses that show, I think pretty clearly, that repentance is not always the same thing as emotion. You know, there's a lot of criminals that are very emotional. Why are they emotional? Because they got caught. <laughs> but they're not repentant. You can show a lot of emotion without ever actually changing your mind about something. So Hebrews 12, 17, this deals with uh, Jacob and Esau. You remember uh, uh, Esau was cheated out of the birthright. And then when he figured out what he lost in the book of Genesis, you know, he got very emotional about it. Um, and this is what it says. For you know that he, even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. Now look at this. For he found no place for repentance. Meta noeo. He was unrepentant. Though... He sought for it with tears. So this guy cried. This guy emoted. And yet, Hebrews 12, 17 says, even though he cried and emoted, he was unrepentant. His mind was never changed. So the, the two ideas of, of, of being emotionally upset and repenting, uh, we, we conflate these ideas with with English, in English language, but that's not how Greek functions. 
Emotion is a completely different word in the Greek language. So don't confuse repentance with emotion. Uh, remember one of the disciples, Judas, did he feel bad about what he did? Judas sold out for 30 pieces of silver, you remember. Ma- and he felt bad about it. Matthew 27, verse 3 says, Then when Judas had betrayed him, he saw that he had been condemned. He felt remorse. Now that's metamelomai. And returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. Judas cried. Judas felt bad. But did Judas ever repent? No, he did not. How do I know that? I know that because of the end of John 6. John 6, 64 says, but there, Jesus speaking, there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. Now, he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So this very clearly says the one that betrays me, Judas, would never believe. Judas never believed. That's why Jesus says of Judas, it would be better for him if he had never been born. So he was unrepentant. He He never changed his mind about Christ. And yet, back to Matthew 27, verse 33, he had a lot of metamelomai. He had a lot of emotion. So you should not confuse emotion with bona fide repentance or changing your mind about who Christ is. So um, another example, take a look at Acts 2.38. We were there just a little while ago. You might go back to Acts 2.37. Jim in his PowerPoint writes this, the first example of apostolic preaching of repentance is Peter's sermon recorded in Acts 2.38. That's where Peter told folks that were unbelievers to repent. Change your mind about who Christ is. Go from being a Christ-rejecting Jew to a Christ-accepting Jew, which is a synonym for faith. The first example of apostolic preaching of repentance is Peter's sermon recorded in Acts 2.38. There he responded to the crowd's question, What shall we do? With the words repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now go back to verse 37. Notice that the text, verse 37, the immediately preceding verse, describes the emotional state of the people. What does that text say? It says they were cut to the heart. That's the uh, Greek verb, Kata uh, So they heard the message, they were cut to the heart. What does that word mean? It connotes a sharp pain connected with remorse or anxiety. This is a description of their deepest, innermost feelings. So Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, and he talked about how the nation of Israel had betrayed Jesus Christ and killed innocent blood. And there were 3,000 Jews sitting there hearing that message, and they felt really bad about it. They felt guilty. But Peter was not content to let them simply feel guilty. Because feeling guilty in and of itself doesn't save anybody. What he communicated to them is to allow that guilt that they were experiencing to manifest itself and to propel them to changing their minds about Jesus Christ. So he went on and he actually told them to repent. Peter's admonition to repent, therefore, must certainly address another kind of response besides emotional grief. See, if emotional grief is repentance, then Peter could have just left them as they were in verse 37 and dropped out what he told them to do in verse 38. Peter's admonition to repent, therefore, must certainly address another kind of response besides emotional grief. 
Clearly, the people were compelled by feelings of remorse to seek an avenue of change, and it was for this reason that Peter says, repent, or in other words, change your mind and attitude about Jesus Christ. But how were these devout Jewish men brought to this point? This is the crucial question. There are clues in the context about the focus of their repentance. First of all, Peter addresses the specific sin of Israel's crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. In the context then, verse 37 reveals the source of their remorse was the mistake of crucifying the Messiah. Now they must repent or change their minds about who he is and change their disposition toward him. Charles Talbert, a scholar, comments, the condemnation of Christ had been done in ignorance, but in raising Jesus, God showed that the Jews, that they had made a mistake. They had crucified Christ. Now, however, the Jews are given a chance to change their minds or to repent. If emotion wasn't enough, Peter would have just said, if emotion was enough, Peter would have just said, you guys already repented, you feel bad. But obviously, emotion is not bona fide repentance because he moved them from emotion to pushing them towards an actual change of mind. Just trying to demonstrate here that sorrow and repentance are two different things. That's my point. Dwight Pentecost agrees and writes, they had already come to regret their sin. Now Peter urges them on to a change of mind about Christ. Of course, repentance to the exclusive Jewish audience had special significance in that they had to change their attitude about their own righteousness in contrast to God's provided Messiah. Notice that the progression in Acts 2, 37 and 38 is expressed by 2 Corinthians seven ten. For godly sorrow produces salvation. See how sorrow and repentance are different words? I think I misspoke there. For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation. From their sorrow, the Jews were led to the point of repentance. And being repentant, they simultaneously believed in Christ. Their remorse over their sin of crucifying Christ moved them toward a true repentance which focused on their thinking about Christ. Simply put, Peter challenged these heartbroken Jews to change their minds and attitudes, repent about Messiah a change that, if real, would then lead to their outward identification with Christ through baptism, the natural result of the new spiritual birth. So what is the bottom line here? BLT, bottom line time. Repentance means change of mind, which is a synonym for faith. Repentance does not mean emotion. A repentant person many times experiences emotion, but emotion in and of itself does not constitute the biblical definition of repentance. Comprende so far? One more and we're done here. Repentance also does not mean turning from sin. What are we telling unbelievers? Are we telling them, Clean yourself up and come to Jesus? Give up sins A, B, and C and come to Jesus? Is that our gospel to the unbelievers? May God help us if that's what we're preaching to them for the simple reason that we just preached works to them. And by using sloppy language, they've interpreted our message as a works-oriented message. Repentance does not mean turn from sin. The gospel is not clean yourself up and come to Christ. The gospel is come to Christ by way of faith and then guess what enters you? The Holy Spirit. And guess what he starts to work on after you're saved? Sinful tendencies, sinful problems. But you see, because we're so untaught on the subject, we've got the cart before the horse many times. 
and we're well-intentioned, but we just preached a wrong message, see? So uh, just a couple of, uh, now I'm going to bring up John MacArthur. When I do this, people pick up stones to stone me to death. Let me say this. I like John MacArthur. John, we hear him on the radio and other things. He says a lot of good things. But on the doctrine of salvation, we have a vast area of disagreement with him. It's not that the man has, hasn't done good things in other areas. But his gospel presentation and doctrine of salvation is very, very confused. And I'll be saying a lot more about that next time. John MacArthur writes in his book, The Gospel According to Jesus, he says, in the Gospel According to Jesus, John MacArthur initially agrees for the basic meaning of change of mind for repentance, but then later says, biblically, its meaning does not stop there. He's about to load up the word repentance with a bunch of other stuff. Echoing this sentiment, Mark Mueller declares repentance is far more than a change of mind about who Christ is. We would disagree with that. We think repentance is a change of mind about who Christ is, period. The basic tenet for both Reformed theologians and Lordship advocates, those terms we'll be defining later on in the course, According to this view, one is saved by repenting, which always means a turning from sin. Ken Gentry puts it this way, the necessary element in salvatory repentance is a true recognition of one's evil state and a decided resolve to forsake sin and thrust oneself at Christ's mercy. Look at all that baggage he just dumped into the word repentance. It's not just a change of confidence, as we've tried to argue, which is a synonym for faith. It's a resolve to forsake sin and thrust oneself at Christ for mercy. It's a recognition of one's evil state. This uh, gentleman, Mark Mueller, goes on, repentance is related to the issue of sin which also includes unbelief in Christ. The primary New Testament word, metanoeo, always speaks of a change of purpose, specifically a turning from sin. See, I'm quoting the guys we don't agree with, just to show you what's out there and what you're hearing and reading in Christian literature. John MacArthur made that statement. Some illustrative quotes from the Lordship Camp. Here's A.W. Pink. Look at all the baggage he just throws into the word repentance. Repentance is a supernatural and inward revelation from God, giving a deep consciousness of what I am in His sight, which causes me to loathe and condemn myself. How do you know if you've loathed or condemned yourself enough? How much loathing do you have to do to get saved? My goodness. Which, I, which caused me to loathe and condemn myself, resulting in a bitter, bitter sorrow for sin, a holy horror and hatred for sin, and a turning away from or forsaking sin. I don't, I don't deny that God does this in people. But it's after the Spirit comes into them. To get the Spirit into them in the first place, they have to come to Christ on Christ's terms, which is believe only. As stated, these definitions make turning away from sin an essential and necessary component of repentance and ultimately salvation. Richard Trench, a lot of scholarship here today, I'm sorry about that. Richard Trench, getting very near to wrapping up, by the way. If if I don't wrap up fast, I will repent for going too long. Richard Trench deals a fatal blow to this idea of a greater meaning, demonstrating that these added concepts have been forced Upon the text. You see, what is happening is people are reading their theology into the text rather than getting their theology what? From the text. That's the basic difference here. That's why I started with a basic lexical definition of repentance means. So Richard Trent says, it is only after metanoeo or metanoeia has been 
taken up in the uses of Scripture that it becomes predominantly to mean a change of mind with the added idea of taking a wiser view of the past, a regret for all ill done in the past, and out of this is a change of life for the better. Richard Trent says this, all of these meanings people are bringing to the word repentance is imported into and does, and does not etymologically nor yet by primary usage lie in the word itself. Did you get that? This so-called greater meaning for metanoeo came into the picture only after certain theologians added to its legitimate and received definition as demonstrated by all the lexical sources we quoted a little earlier. Closing verse here, John 4, woman at the well. Was this woman messed up, the woman at the well? What do you think? Pretty messed up. Look at John 4, verse 10. Unsaved woman, a Samaritan. Jesus answered her and said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked, and he would have given you living water. Jesus tells her, Receive the living water that I want to give to you, which would be the Holy Spirit by way of faith. I want you to see how morally messed up this lady was. Verses 17 through 19. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said I have have no husband. You have had five husbands. And the one whom you are currently with, he is not your husband. This you have said correctly. Go get your husband. I don't have a husband. Jesus said, You just answered correctly because you've had not one but five. And your current, for lack of a better expression, bed buddy, you're not even married to. And then you have this tremendous statement that she makes in verse 19. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Good answer. What I'm trying to say is you cannot get a more morally messed up person than the woman at the well in John 4. Look at what Charles Ryrie says in his study Bible. Charles Ryrie, as we said in prayer time, passed away uh, this week. He writes this, In John 4.10, new life through the Spirit, salvation is a gift from Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. Notice that Christ asked the woman to receive him and his gift without any prerequisite change in her life. He never told her you need to quit sleeping around and receive the Holy Spirit. You need to stop being sexually immoral and receive the Holy Spirit. What he simply said is you need water to come into you that will quench this desire that you have for meaning that is being misdirected by you into all of these promiscuous experiences. But if, if, if the gospel is clean yourself up and come to Jesus, if there was an, ever an opportunity for Jesus to preach that, this is it. You can't get a more morally confused person than this woman. But you'll notice, as Ryrie said, that Jesus asked the woman to receive him and his gift without any prerequisite change in her life. He didn't tell her to alter her behavior at all. What he said is you need to receive me and my resources by faith. Now, guess what happens when the resources of God come into you? What happens to your behavior? Typically starts to change. Some slower than others, but there's usually some kind of change that manifests itself. Ryrie says after she believed, because she believed, her way of living would be changed. And was it ever? She went out and became a tremendous evangelist for Christ. When you get to the end of John 4, that's because something greater than herself entered her. You see that? And Jesus, as he evangelizes her, is not getting the cart before the horse. 
the change of behavior comes on the other side once you have received the gospel by way of faith. Conclusion. Is repentance a condition for receiving eternal life? Question mark. Yes. If it is repentance or changing one's mind about Jesus Christ. No. If it means to be sorry for sin or to resolve to turn away from sin, for these things will not save. Conclusion. Is repentance a condition to faith? No. Though a sense of sin and the desire to turn away from it may be used by the Holy Spirit to direct someone to the Savior in His salvation, Repentance may prepare the way for faith, but it is faith that saves, not repentance, unless repentance as understood as a what? Synonym for faith or changing one's mind. So hopefully, I haven't confused everybody, taught you how to harmonize repentance with faith alone. Next week we look at how to harmonize the teachings of following Christ as Lord with faith alone. So we'll stop now and we'll let folks pick up their kids. Sorry for going about five minutes longer than I wanted. And feel free to, we'll open it up for Q&A, those that want to stick around for that.